Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, 5G Future Outlook and Safety Aspects. Thank you all for joining us today for this discussion on significant aspects of health and safety as India works towards its 5G preparedness. These issues have been deliberated on for some time now to formulate appropriate policies by countries. Currently, over 130 countries have adopted the ICNIP 1998 guidelines. ICNIP stands for the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection. It's an independent expert scientific commission that has conducted scientific studies and issued guidelines to ensure protection of all people against any health hazards when they're exposed to radio frequency like electromagnetic fields. In 2020, these guidelines were revised and subsequently adopted by Australia, UK, and other countries recently. Some countries adopt the ones prescribed by federal communications commissions of the USA, and some have adopted a different set of domestic guidelines, India being one of them. Poland and Lithuania are among countries that recently adopted the limits after recognizing that the previous restrictive limits do not provide any additional health benefit and were a barrier to successful 5G deployment. In this webinar today, we are joined by healthcare experts, representatives from the telco industry, government officials and others for a discussion that would help throw light on some concerns. We take a look at some international practices and evidence-based studies that would help inform appropriate policy on health and safety for India. I would like to now welcome Lieutenant General Dr. S.P. Kocher to address the floor with his welcome remarks. General Kocher currently is the Director General of COAI. In 2013, he retired as the Signal Officer in Chief, Head of the ICT Wing of the Indian Army. He was responsible for planning, executing, and operating all telecom and IT networks of the Army. Prior to that, he was additional Director General Personnel of the Indian Army, handling HR and empowerment of the 11 lakh strong Army. He's been on numerous GCs and boards of universities, government bodies, and corporates. Prior to joining as DGCOAI, he was the CEO of Telecom Sector Skill Council from December 2013 to 2020. He holds a PhD from IGNU and MTech from IIT Delhi, two MPhils, and has published a book and authored several articles. He's hallmarked by an out-of-box approach and innovative thinking. Over to you, General Dr. Kocher. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our esteemed chief guest, Shri Sanjeev Agarwalji, Member Technology, Digital Communication Commission, Ministry of Communications, Government of India. Thank you, sir, for kindly accepting our humble request to grace this event with your esteemed presence. I warmly welcome all our eminent speakers and panelists, our co-hosts uh, and partners for this event, the GSMA team, industry colleagues, valued attendees, ladies and gentlemen. We are delighted to welcome you all to this webinar jointly organized by COI and GSMA on 5G future outlook and safety aspects. Today's webinar will focus on how 5G will become a game changer as the next evolution of mobile wireless technology and how there is a need for the current EMF norms to be reviewed in line with global standards and best practices for delivering the best 5G services to the Indian mobile user. I think our learned guests and attendees are very much aware of the potential of 5G to reshape both our professional and personal lives by enabling new use cases in vital sectors such as education, healthcare, transportation, manufacturing, smart cities, entertainment, gaming, and so on. Uh, with advanced applications like robotic surgery, augmented oblique virtual oblique mixed reality, connected vehicles, drones, and many other things. 5G rollout and the pickup in India have been the fastest in the world. It is going strong as per expectations. Everyone is working to ensure a very fast rollout in the country. Till the time we reach a stage when the country is saturated with 5G, there will be teething problems, which happen whenever there is a change in technology. One such issue is, public, is the public concern on alleged health effects of non-ionizing EMF emissions from mobile towers, which poses apparently a hurdle in deployment of the network infrastructure in certain cases. Misinformation regarding the subject and ignorance of the scientific facts often lead to resistance from certain quarters, be it the local authorities or the public 
towards installation of mobile towers. Presently, as you're aware, India follows extremely stringent norms for EMF emissions from mobile towers, which are one tenth of the globally followed guidelines prescribed by the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiations Protection, ICNIP, an independent international expert group formally recognized by the WHO. The limits recommended by ICNIP are based on reviews of all relevant scientific literature and have already been set up with a significant margins to protect from short-term and long-term health effects of exposure to RF EMF. In 2020, the ICNAP published further updated guidelines considering the latest available scientific research, introducing some additions and changes. Some countries have already adopted the new norms, which are technologically independent, meaning that the same limits apply for all radio technologies, including 5G. I also recall that the Honorable Union Minister of Communication and IT, Shri Ashwini Vaishnav, had said in a media interview that when it comes to EMF emission levels from mobile towers, we should look at these things from a good evidence and scientific data point of view. He opined that we should have the same standards as the rest of the world so that our ability to provide good quality telecom services is not hampered. This is significant. The industry has requested DOT to consider reviewing the EMF norms in India and adopting the latest international norms. The industry believes that adopting the ICNIP 2020 norms would provide adequate safeguards against EMF exposure, while also not posing a hindrance to the efficient network deployment and delivery of the latest technologies for advanced digital services and the varied benefits to our citizens. COI is happy to collaborate with GSMA for this important webinar. I definitely look forward to the views of the esteemed expert speakers we have with us today and to the insightful discussions in the session ahead. Thank you very much. Natasha? You're on mute. Natasha, you're on mute. I'm on mute. Thank you, General Dr. Kocher. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Julian Gorman, our next speaker for the event, um, is unable to join due to connectivity issues. I see that he's there, but I think uh, he's having uh, connectivity issues. So he's shared with us a pre-recording. Um, Mr. Gorman is the head of Asia Pacific for the GSMA, uh, leading a highly experienced cross-functional team to advance the impact, growth, and sustainability of digital economies by collaboration between the mobile industry, policymakers, and ecosystem. He's a global telecom executive with over 20 years of commercial and marketing experience across wholesale, business, regulatory, policy, and digital transformation. He's pioneered new digital partnerships and business units in mature and emerging markets across Africa, Europe, Australia, and Asia. As advisor to management executive teams and boards, he has extensive insight and relationships to support collaboration and delivery of industry alignment. He's been recognized for his leadership in digital innovation, digital women, health and agriculture services with industry awards and brands. He has degrees in mechanical engineering and law from Australia. Uh, I request the recording to be played for, for Mr. Gorman, please. Great. General Kacha, fellow speakers, distinguished guests, good afternoon and a warm welcome to this 5G Future Outlook and Safety Aspects webinar hosted in partnership between GSMA and COAI. I'd firstly like to take this opportunity to congratulate the Government of India, the Department of Telecoms, TRI, and other relevant agencies on all the work they've been undertaking to advance the 5G journey in India. There have been a number of supportive measures over recent months which have contributed to the progress of 5G rollout and is in this context of modernization and digital India ambitions, I provide these opening comments. Now, when it comes to safety, spectrum and EMF science are at the core of GSMA's scope and the basic building blocks of mobile technology. The first time I ever climbed over a barbed wire fence to climb a 50 metre telecom tower on top of a mountain west of Sydney when I was a teenager, I wanted to see the view to Sydney over 50 kilometres away. Now, after more than 25 years in telecoms, a tower means more to me than a great view. 
It's a physical expression of the technology that now connects more than two thirds of the world's population, generates more than 5% of the world's GDP and directly employs more than 16 million people around the world. But it is the towers and their antennas which are often the focus of the EMF debate. And I know today's webinar will help elevate that discussion to a more science-based framework for stakeholders to engage. But when it comes to EMF, it is critical as an industry, critical for leaders of digital nations and pursuing people to pursuing digital economies, and critical to all of us for the future prosperity and sustainability of our planet, that we develop, maintain, and comply with global standards and specifications for EMF. EMF standards have been developed with over 50 years of study. The International Commission for Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, or ICNERP, an independent expert scientific commission that provides scientific advice and guidance on the health and environmental effects of non-ionizing radiation that, to protect people and the environment, and also with World Health Organization and other government agencies, have established the latest global guidelines after much study and debate. Already, Australia, Ireland, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and UK are amongst countries who have adopted the ICNOP 2020 guidelines. India has imposed requirements 10 times more restrictive than global standards. The impact on the cost to roll out and the message it conveys compromise the Digital India vision. To depart from evidence-based, harmonized international standards and to not draw on the recommendations by expert bodies such as the World Health Organization and the ITU compromises the digital vision of India and also its credibility to be a world telecom superpower as it risks fragmenting the global technology ecosystem. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, India's support and compliance with the international EMF standards carries immense significance. By accepting the responsibility for global harmonization that comes with the ambitions to be the next telecom superpower, it enhances its reputation and credibility and has an opportunity to advance its own digital economy and the benefits to its own citizens of the technology that's being developed. I encourage you to participate in this webinar today actively by asking questions and engaging in the chat. Mobile technology has already given the world so much uh, to the way we communicate with each other and to the world around us. And we must protect the trust and confidence that has earned over the years so that we can continue to build a world of inclusive, sustainable and safe digital nations for our children and future generations. I'd like to thank CII for collaborating on today's webinar and look forward to more efficient and value-adding activity in the future. Thank you for your attention and I wish you all a productive and enlightening discussion ahead. Thank you for playing that and, and thank you, Julian. Um, we would now like to move to the next part of our webinar. Uh, we have a presentation by subject matter expert, Dr. Jack Rowley. Uh, Dr. Rowley is a senior director for research and sustainability at the GSMA. He's responsible for technical and policy activities related to the safety of mobile communications. He has more than 50, 30 years of experience in the telecom industry, contributes to national and international EMF working groups and has published extensively on the issues we are discussing today at this webinar. Over to you, Jack. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Natasha, and thank you to the organizers for this opportunity to speak. Uh, my involvement with EMF in India goes back to before the adoption of the HICNOP standard uh, in the country when there were no EMF rules. And I hope that I can continue as part of the discussions as India considers moving back to alignment with the global uh, scientific community and the harmonized approach to EMF limits. So I've got a handful of slides that I will share to try and bring us up to date on a few developments that I think are important to the discussions in, in India. Um, first off, from the scientific point of view, uh, could you, could, Natasha, can you confirm you can see my slides? Um, not yet, Jack. Okay, thank you. Yes. Great, you thank you. Now. All right, so I just want to pick out a couple of pieces of information from the scientific point of view. The first one is the question of mobile phone use and brain cancers. Um, when we were discussing whether India might move from the international limits because of uh, concerns back in around 2011, 2012, one of the questions that was in mind was whether there's a risk of increased risk of brain cancer from using mobile phones. We have now 10 more years of data 
and this recent publication from IARC, the International Agency for Research in Cancer, which is a WHO uh, agency specializing in cancer research, says there really is no evidence to link mobile phone use and brain cancer. And what you see on the slide is on the, the left side, you see a series of almost horizontal lines, which are the brain cancer rates in Nordic countries, Nordic countries chosen because they were among the first and earliest adopters of mobile phones. And then on the right, you see how we move from uh, almost nobody having a mobile phone in the 80s to uh, by the middle 2000s, almost everyone having a mobile phone. And this is really important because this study looked at the up latencies of up to 20 years and saw no risk increase. And it looked at the kind of uh, excess risks that are claimed in some of the scientific literature, and they're not supported by the real observations we see. Uh, so IARC as a WHO agency saying there's no link between a mobile, oh, sorry, mobile phone use and glioma incidence, which is a type of brain cancer is really important. The other topic I wanna to just touch on is impacts on animals and plants, because this is something that I remember was very much part of the discussion in India. And there was a lot of misinformation and false claims about the deployment of mobile networks impacting the sparrows and health uh, in Indian cities, where the real effect was uh, one of related to, to new building infrastructure rather than to, to the base stations. In 2019, the German agency responsible for EMF hosted an international scientific workshop where they brought together experts from around the world who provided an update on the latest science on this issue. The reports from those workshops were published uh, just in the last few months. And in terms of the frequencies above 100 megahertz, which resolves or refers to all the signals relative to mobile communications, you will see that they concluded there was no proven scientific evidence of adverse effects in animals or plants under realistic environmental conditions. Uh, so it gives us confidence that the limits that are providing protection for the public are also providing protection for animals and plants. From the point of view of India uh, and the discussion around 5G, this has been something that uh, India among many governments had to come to the fore in 2020 when the extreme claims around 5G and COVID um, occurred around the world, when we had attacks on infrastructure in many countries in Europe, in South America and parts of, of the Asia Pacific. And so we had a consistent voice from authorities, including those in India saying, there's no health risk from 5G, it has to comply with the international limits. And this is something that's been useful to see this vocal response from administrations to that misinformation. And if there's one message I would say to take away from this, it's important that, uh, TEC, DOT, TRAI, and all the other institutions in India who are trusted should continue to emphasize the scientific consensus that the limits provide protection uh, from all established health risks of electromagnetic field exposure. If we think of this in terms of globally, where this is a significant time, we are in a transitional period. We've heard several references to Wicknock 2020, so I won't say anything more about that. Uh, late last year, the European Commission Scientific Expert Group recommended in a preliminary opinion that the European Union should adopt Wicknock 2020 as the basis for public health limits. Uh, I had hoped that we would have the final opinion by the, the time of this webinar, but I just checked again just before we started and we're still waiting on it but they expect to be no changes in that conclusion. The other message from the European Commission Scientific Committee is that it's important for administrations to monitor the outcomes of the WHO process. And that WHO process is on the way as we speak. Uh, in 2021, the World Health Organization commissioned a series of systematic reviews, looking at all the scientific evidence related to radio frequency signals and health, those systematic reviews in turn will feed into a task group, which commenced work earlier this year, and will perform an overall health risk assessment looking at cancer and non-cancer endpoints. And one of the things that will come out of that is a series of policy recommendations. When WHO went through this exercise for static fields, 
and for extremely low frequency fields in previous years, one of the recommendations coming from that was to adopt international limits such as those of ICNIR. And we would expect that to be the same in, with the WHO process. So again, it's timely for India to be reviewing the limits. There's the potential to rely on these outcomes from the WHO process as being the global scientific consensus on what uh, provides protection. Several speakers have already mentioned that some countries have moved to adopt the latest international guidelines. Uh, that's consistent with the conclusions of the ITUD study group two report on EMF at the end of the last period, which says that for administrations, the best practice is to adopt the ICNO 2020 guidelines. And you can see in the table on the, on the chart, countries that have already moved to adopt either ICNO 98 or ICNO 2020 limits, there's not a huge difference in the actual values as they apply to base stations, though there are some technical refinements. Importantly, some of those countries had quite restrictive limits. So Lithuania uh, moved increases limits by a factor of 10 to, to adopt ICNO 2020. In Poland, they moved by a factor of 100 increase to adopt ICNO 2020. And why? Do these countries make that? Well, in Lithuania's case, they recognize that restrictive limits were affecting 4G today and would make it more difficult for 5G tomorrow. And for Poland as well, they realized that to make uh, 5G a success in the country, they would need to have the more international limits. And they've they did represented it by this chart that you can see on the screen where you can have much greater coverage as represented by the larger circle because you can have higher powered sites with the ICNRP limits. If you have restrictive limits, you need to have many more sites to provide the same level of coverage. And even then, it may be difficult to provide equivalent coverage because it's difficult to provide in particular in-building coverage uh, and other issues may mean you get coverage holes. So we do see this global momentum to adopt the ICNRP 2020 limits. Uh, and I hope that India will be part of that discussion going forward. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. I look forward to discussion. Thank you so much, Jack. Um, we now welcome Member Technology Department of Telecommunications, um, Sri Sanjeev Agarwal, for a special address. Sri Agarwal is an ITS officer of 1984 batch. Uh, he joined the department in 1986. He's responsible for the implementation part of DOT policies in the field. Before joining as member technology, he had worked as OST to member technology and senior uh, DDG in UP West LSA in Meerut. He had also planned MPLS TP based network for the country for BSNL, besides planning and procurement of other transmission related equipment and optical fiber. He was involved with maintenance of long distance network as CGM NTR BSNL. He's worked in many fields of telecoms, like the installation of electronic exchanges, operation and maintenance of electronic exchanges, and others. Over to you, Sri Agarwal. Thank you, Nabasha, for that uh, introduction. Uh, good evening. Uh, Lieutenant General Dr. S.P. Kocher, DG, CO, and I, COI, uh, Dr. Jack Rowdy, Mr. Gorman from GSMA. Industry members, representative of COI, representatives of GSMA, and distinguished panelists. This is an important meeting, and I congratulate uh, our COI for organizing this webinar. This is a very important for uh, having a discussion, and we need to move forward as we had discussed earlier. So, telecommunication has been recognized in the world over as important tool for socio-economic development of a nation. It has become core infrastructure required for rapid growth and the modernization of various sectors of the economy. In particular, 5G, which has few uh, features of low latency, high capacity and increased bandwidth as compared to 4G and others, has the potential to change the socio-economic fabric in India and transform the society at large. This have far reaching impact on, on uh, how people live, how people work and play all over the country. The success of initiative like Digital India, Smart Cities, etc. that depends mainly on the telecom services 
and its deployment. As far as the 5G rollout is concerned, after the launch on uh, 1st of October 2022 by the Honorable Prime Minister of India, we have seen the fastest rollout, one of the fastest rollout in the world in India. As of now, we are having more than 175,000 BTSs deployed all over the country by our telecom service providers. So DOT will continue to support the TSP to roll out the robust 5G infrastructure in the country at the earliest so that citizen of the country uh, make the best use of the features of 5G in coming days. In order to facilitate, we have extended the right of way rules and we have eased it out. And all our state governments have also adopted those norms so that deployment of uh, infrastructure can be uh, very fast. The government's uh, progressive objective to provide digital connectivity to all citizens necessitates the development of robust telecom infrastructure across the length and width of the country. So to deliver the benefits of 5G to all. A ubiquitous pan-India 5G network will also help us realize the vision of digital India while leading us on the path to become a $1 trillion digital economy. We understand that there are concerns about uh, electromagnetic field radiations and uh, we have to sort it out. Uh, post uh, decades of research and studies on the subject, till date there is no scientific evidence established to indicate any adverse effect of uh, due to no uh, low level of non-ionizing RF emissions from mobile towers. So WHO uh, referred to approximately 25,000 studies published all around the world over the last 30 years. And based on that, they had concluded that current evidence does not confirm the existence of any health consequence from exposure to low level of magnetic electromagnetic field. For the past many years, Government of India has taken significantly safe, significant safety measures and adopted global, globally accepted guidelines from the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, ICNIRP, the basis of restrictions and reference levels for limiting EMF exposures. This has been incorporated into the licenses of the operators. As we all know, it is as of now one-tenth of the existing ICNIRP norms. In March 2020, ICNIRP has produced updated guidelines to ensure the protection of people again against all established health hazards when they are exposed to radio frequency EMF in the range of 100 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. With the advent of 5G adoption taking place all across the country, multiple changes are expected in the network for the continued optimization exercises. It is obvious that 5G will need to perform well for the users to experience improved services and derive the benefit of this advanced technology. So we are looking into all these aspects and reviewing the uh, guidelines based on IC and IRP 2020. So uh, we will be coming out soon with the recommendations after a discussion with all the interministerial uh, communication which we are uh, holding. Presently, DOT through our LSAs, we are also monitoring and we are trying to create the awareness among the public, uh, the government, central government, state government, local bodies about uh, the misconception about this uh, radiation part and uh, all the myths of adverse health effect due to low level of RF emissions from the mobile towers. So DOT has also launched a Tarang Sanchar uh, portal where the information is shared with the public and anyone can visit that and see the EMF emission compliances uh, to generate confidence and conviction with, the, with regard to the safety from mobile towers, clearing all the myths and misconceptions. Even public uh, on their demand can ask for testing of any particular tower and we do that from our LSAs and uh, they are given a certificate that uh, the uh, all the norms are being followed and it is well within the limits 
that are being prescribed by the government of india so uh, with all these activities and i am very hopeful with the studies uh, which gsma has taken up and uh, the information which we are having from various countries we will be able to adopt uh, a better norms which will not be causing hindrance to roll out of 5g and uh, i would look forward for the deliberations in this uh, webinar also where uh, detailed deliberations by the panelists will be taking place and uh, probably will be able to come out with the uh, certain guidelines which we can use it further for making that possible thank you very much thank you so much shri agarwal for sharing those useful pieces of information and telling us about all the work that dot is doing um in the next segment of this webinar we have a panel discussion with representatives from relevant industries uh, the moderator for this discussion is mr vikram tivatia the deputy director general of the coai uh, in this role mr tivatia interacts extensively with the ict industry leadership and senior officials at dot mit trai and other government offices uh, for regulatory and policy matters He is a member of the joint working group on cyber security chaired by chief cyber security coordinator an active member of national industry associations he participates in many international workshops conferences conducted by ITU APT etc he serves on the board of the global certification forum his prior assignments include working with tata teleservices limited confederation of indian industries as their cio and with the indian army where he took a voluntary retirement as a colonel in 2005 I request Mr. Tivatia to introduce the panelists and kickstart the discussion. Over to you, Mr. Tivatia. Uh, good evening, Natasha, and thank you very much. Uh, I, I think we've had a very interesting uh, points raised, and we thank uh, uh, Sri Sanjeev Agarwal ji for you know acknowledging that there is a very intrinsic need to uh, review uh, the current EMF norms uh, and try and align them uh, like the national digital. a communication policy says along with international approaches to this and uh, very good points by jack as well uh, i have the privilege now of having uh, a very experienced and an expert panel here with us and to begin with we have dr vivek tandon uh, he is uh, currently the professor of neurosurgery at the all india institute of medical sciences at new delhi and has more than 100 publications Uh, um, uh, to his credit but uh, most uh, you know notingly i uh, i see that he is the chairman of the 5g committee for uh, improving hospital telecom networks so vivek uh, uh, dr vivek anything that we can help with uh, we would be uh, really happy and of course we've seen you uh, be with us at coai at multiple interactions for creating awareness so thank you for joining us and along with uh, dr tanan we also have uh, Uh, uh mr rahul watts uh, rahul is the chief regulatory officer indian south asia for bharti airtel and he's also the director for one web communications and vice chair of the indian space associations uh rahul has a long experience uh, with the uh, leading corporations on telecom licensing economic and digital regulations and spectrum management and uh, very active on the regulatory litigation part Uh, his uh, domain expertise has been extensively used in global forums by OneWeb, UK, Axiata, Malaysia, Indosat. Uh, he has uh, the most, uh, besides being from the University of Pune, he's also done uh, M. I'm Ahmedabad and Wharton School, uh, Pennsylvania, and also serves on many in, uh, leading industry associations. And uh, joining us with him is uh, Mr. P. Balaji. Uh, um, ba Mr. Balaji. Uh, Hi Balaji, if we can see you, it'll be really nice. Anyway, so uh, Balaji is a member of the core leadership team at uh, Vodafone Idea Limited, which is India's leading telecom operator, serving uh, citizens and enterprises across the country. And this, uh, uh, as part of this leadership team, uh, they have uh, successfully led the planning and execution of one of the world's uh, largest telecom merger in a record time of two years. and he leads the company's regulatory public policy and government relations uh, with industry advocacy he earlier been uh, president of the tima of the tpc and is also the chairman of the asocham national digital communication council uh, uh, he was an, he's an engineer from iit roorkee and also did his mba from iim ahmedabad 
and we have a long standing industry colleague, uh, Ravi. Uh, Mr. Ravi Gandhi is an expert in public policy, regulatory affairs, very active at the COI. He's currently uh, working at the president uh, and chief public policy and regulatory at the Reliance Group. And prior to this current role, he also served as the chief regulatory officer at Bharti Airtel. Three decades, a diverse experience. Earlier, he was also, uh, you know, with the Department of Telecom, uh, where he served for a long time. And he has a proven history of taking on complex challenges and uh, coming to unique solutions. Uh, he's also a PhD from the Indian Institute of Technology. So thank you all, uh, my esteemed panelists, as well as, uh, uh, you know, all the participants who have joined. And it is very heartening to have 108 participants uh, from all over the country who have joined. So that is the advantage of having a webinar versus a physical set. A lot of officers uh, from the DOT's uh, uh, LSA units and many from the state governments. So thank you all for joining us. And as has been articulated uh, by the earlier speakers, uh, this is a very important topic and the need for India to align internationally. And I would begin uh, with uh, requesting Balaji uh, to share his thoughts. Now, what has been you know, uh, 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 seen in the last is that the strict EMF standard does not actually contribute to uh, help protect the public health. Uh, instead, it affects deployment progress of the carrier networks and this uh, uh, deployment costs as well. Whereas the actual measured EMF exposure level uh, may be far below the safety standard. Uh, so, is, uh, so some thoughts on that, as well as, you know, like Member T mentioned, how can we exploit Tarang Sanchar to raise advocacy on this topic? Mm. Over to you, Balaji. Thank you, Vikram, um, and uh, really a huge thanks to our esteemed uh, panelists and the earlier speakers. Um, I think as has been already uh, enunciated by earlier speakers, um, uh, the, the telecom sector has had a huge role to play in the socioeconomic growth of, uh, of, uh, you know, the, of the world at large in the Indian context, the fact that we now cover uh, 1.3 billion people with the telecom service, uh, with pretty much in the Indian context, uh, the broadband penetration that's taken place and created huge impact from a societal perspective, uh, you know, with, with 20 odd GB of cons consumption by users every month, is a testimony of the fact that the industry has done everything possible with the support of the government and the regulator to make sure that the vision of inclusive growth um, is accomplished. Uh, I think the job is still uh, a long way to be completed. Uh, 4G ubiquitous, 5G uh, getting deployed uh, at scale and in the future, 6G also kind of coming in. Uh, huge opportunities for the uh, opportunity for the nation to kind of achieve the Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister's vision of about a trillion dollar uh, digital economy. And that's gonna happen only when there's a lot of deployment that takes place at scale. Uh, and also if the uh, ease of rolling out happens. And in a, in a time like that, it is extremely important that uh, uh, that whatever is done is done with the on the basis of very strong scientific evidence. And as you said, and earlier speakers have pointed out, uh, clearly uh, we, have, uh, we have still a long way to go in order to ensure that there is huge rollout of sites that takes place of equipment that takes place for low latency and high bandwidth applications. And in that context, <clears throat> we believe that uh, what has been done elsewhere in the world and with a huge body of scientific knowledge available, uh, a pragmatic approach uh, taken uh, at this time will ensure that the nation can progress very rapidly uh, to ensure that there is a uh, lot of uh, inclusive growth that can take place. There's that the industry, which today already is kind of, uh, you know, um, having enough challenges in terms of what do we do with monetization of 5G? What do we do with, uh, you know, um, with a lot of other challenges that we have in terms of uh, right of way, but those which are getting addressed now with the help of DOT at the central uh, level, as well as the LSAs and the term cell that work with us in the clusters can actually, uh, uh, you know, be expedited. And therefore we do believe the time is, I do believe that the time is ripe for us to relook at 
uh, the current uh, emission standards based on scientific evidence that and and as other countries that are very stringent uh, 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 norms on emission have also kind of uh, taken the right approach is WHO and ICNIR standards and so on is also done here because that's the only way that we can ensure that not only that everybody who's at the moment not part of the digital uh, ecosystem of the broadband revolution gets access to it because India is all about scale, India is all about uh, low cost and uh, low pricing and affordability being the key. Unless we address this issue upfront now, uh, it will become extremely difficult to uh, kind of roll out networks at scale on a cost effective manner and therefore onboard others who are at this moment deprived of being part of the digital and broadband revolution. Thank you, Vikram. Uh, thank you so much, Palaji. And, you know, it's really for all of us and all the participants. You see, unlike uh, all the technologies in the past, 5G particularly will require a substantial amount of network densification uh, with the network coming down and merging into street, uh, street level. And that would require, uh, you know, a real approach. So before I come to you, Dr. Tandon, uh, uh, I, I would just like to, you know, give a heads up to Jack. Uh, uh, Jack, firstly, thanks for staying with us. You know, some work at the ITUT uh, later on when I'll come back to you on instead of worst case, uh, the average uh, compliant uh, average exposure uh, that would be helpful. Uh, coming back to you, Dr. Tandon, firstly, uh, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, you know, you would be queried by a large number of patients or other uh, colleagues uh, in addition to, you know, uh, uh, the general public. So, and you've been participating at some of our, you know, webinars to raise this awareness. So, uh, what can you indicate about, you know, what are the major uh, uh, misconceptions that uh, you come across uh, in your interactions? And if there are any, you know, international medical studies uh, to mitigate these public concerns? Over to you, Dr. Tannen. Thank you, uh, Tegatia ji. And uh, I am a neurosurgeon at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and it's a very niche kind of a branch. We see only patients who are referred from other places and who come to AIMS for their tertiary treatment. But when I interact with my colleagues, I get to know that patients which are coming to the ENT department, they sometimes complain of hearing loss. Patients who are coming to the gynecology department, they are complaining of loss of fertility. Patients who are coming to the psychiatry department, they are complaining about attention, cognitive disorders, sleep, and all these things and problems. But if you look at the literature which is existing at present, you will not find much because the simple reason that the evidence isn't available. And when it comes to brain tumor, like just uh, Jack demonstrated to you, that there are no studies which show that, yes, conclusively, which can prove that the incidence of brain tumor increases because of the use of, uh, because of being in the proximity to the uh, exposure or being near to the EMF radiation towers, which are, which are being radiated from these towers. At the most, I can say that because of the lack of conclusive evidence, the WHO has placed EMF into a class 2B carcinogen. And basically class 2B, what means uh, to general public is that these studies are limited and people get confused because of the placement of this into this category of carcinogen 2B type that they start thinking that it's a carcinogen. The fact is that the relative risk when a person gets exposed to these kind of uh, radiations for developing the brain tumor is very, very less because the simple fact that it's a non-ionizing radiation. If you see the literature, you will find that there is no substance on planet Earth which has been researched beyond this EMF field. There are more than 25,000 papers which are existing. And, uh, and despite this, the number of studies which show the harmful effects is quite limited in comparison to the number of studies which show that there is no relation to it. In science, what we believe is that there has to be recapitulation of the previous data. For example, if you are going to switch on a tube light and you switch on the switch, the tube light must get lighted. And if at times it's not happening, we don't consider it to be science. And that is what happens 
when the studies have been re recapitulated in different countries, the same studies have not shown similar kind of results. The best studies, if you bring uh, to, uh, if you re read about the best studies which are existent, then you have a study from, uh, if I'm not wrong, a guy from Italy uh, named as Ramzani Institute of Science, which have demonstrated some relation and they reported it on rats and similarly bioinitiative report, which showed some uh, conclusive evidence in the sense that there were some harmful effects. But these studies have been very uh, much criticized by the scientific community because of the methodology that these people had used. And the same kind of methodology doesn't hold true when a person is getting exposed in the real life situation. And if you look at some other studies which have been published in literature and have been reported by others, whether it's the National Cancer, and Cancer Institute of Science, WHO has taken cognizance of so many studies, the same results are not found to be true. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tandon. Uh, th th that's nice to hear from a uh, doctor's point of view. Uh, we'll come back to you later with, uh, you know, um, uh, it, uh, how in uh, from a doctor's point of view, how can you, you know, bring it into uh, simple words for our audience uh, to understand. But with that, I'll come to uh, you, Rahul. Uh, so, uh, Rahul, you know, you've been part of uh, uh, this whole massive 5G network rollout, which uh, uh, Balaji alluded to, and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, practical experience in rolling out the network. So what are the kind of efforts being put in by TSPs to provide 5G services uh, in India? And what are the various advanced technologies which are leading to this paradigm shift? And if you could also cover on, you know, challenges related to ROW uh, because of, you know, people pointing out that they have, uh, you know, uh, uh, apprehensions about the health effects. Rahul? Thank you, Vikram. Uh, it's uh, nice to be in this panel uh, comprising of Jack and I also heard uh, uh, Dr. Tandon. Uh, so, uh, so let me give you a perspective in terms of 5G. I think uh, Mr. Agarwal is there and with his blessings and DOT's uh, uh, you know, forward-looking vision uh, we have been able to successfully roll out uh, 5G uh, across the country now. We started uh, somewhere in September and we are in the uh, month of uh, October uh, and we are now in nearly May and we have already, uh, uh, you know, covered uh, more than 3,500 cities. We are adding up around 30 to 40 cities every day, uh, lighting up more and more uh, places with 5G. Uh, we are also seeing some interesting trends in terms of uh, 5G uptake. Uh, though uh, the biggest constraint still remains uh, the availability of devices, but uh, we are seeing some early green shoots in terms of traffic uptake happening, uh, particularly in some uh, key urban markets. Uh, you can start seeing the trending towards uh, you know more and more 5G now happening. Uh, it has been a lot of experience for us in rolling out uh, uh, you know uh, 5G. Uh, of course, uh, uh, our friends at Geo have rolled out a different technology, and we have rolled out a different version of the technology and. Uh, and uh, I'm sure uh, both are uh, experiencing, uh, you know, the the, the offshoots uh, of uh, uh, the technology itself. Uh, we are uh, seeing a large amount of uh, data consumption uh, uh, happening now. Already, we were at around 20 GB, uh, you know, consumption, and uh, that trend uh, keeps the positive uh, uptick again in terms of more and more uh, usage of data happening. In terms of rolling out uh, 5G, uh, uh, I think the pace of the rollout is really surprising. Uh, nowhere in the world will you see, uh, you know, TSPs rolling out at such, uh, you know, furious speed. Uh, and uh, the way we are going, I think, uh, more or less by the end of the year or even before that, we should have covered the large parts of the country, uh, you know, as far as the 5G uh, basic coverage is concerned. Uh, it has been, a, a, you know, phase-wise sort of a rollout uh, in terms of 5G because you really wanted to start uh, where you had early fiberization. And wherever we had early fiberization, that were the early picks, you know, to be able to convert onto the 5G. And as we start spreading now, going down to, uh, you know, A, B, C cities, that's where you are seeing a different pattern of rollouts uh, will start to emerge. So overall, I think it's a very, been a very satisfying experience uh, to roll out 5G. Alongside on the way, we have also experimented uh, with a lot of uh, other technologies uh, to complement 5G. For example, some of the 5G use cases, uh, which we have often talked about, uh, working with the Mahindra, Tech Mahindra plant, Chakan in Pune, 
They're trying to build a private network for them, working with Drosh uh, in Bangalore to uh, you know work out a logistics uh, you know sort of a private network for them, and also uh, with LNT where we have worked up uh, with uh, some uh, uh, with thousands of sensors uh, for an agriculture based uh, uh, you know use case, which has really been uh, eye opener. Uh, I think I think for all the stakeholders who were uh, participating in that study. So really, uh, the the use cases have been uh, uh, you know quite dense. And uh, going ahead, I think more and more of these uh, are going to happen as we go along. Uh, FWA is another uh, uh, you know thing which we are looking on uh, for future. We are still looking out uh, at the right uh, you know commercials to be able to roll out on a mass scale uh, the FWA. So so we'll continue to see what is the best option and how best do we make it available uh, at the at the at the soon as possible. Uh, in terms of the ROW challenges, uh, you know which were mentioned. Uh, I think the challenges uh, uh, have been pretty much same as they were earlier uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know the towers which we were facing. Uh, thankfully, on, at, per se in ROW itself, uh, the, the DOT and the government has taken a very aggressive and a positive stand and the Gazette notifications that have really been very enabling uh, you know in, in, in terms of rolling out uh, you know the ROW and getting the permissions fast. We are seeing a lot of uptrend and activity happening. There are, uh, particularly after the Pragadi portal is also started functioning very well now. And we are seeing a lot of, uh, you know, activities happening uh, for early culmination. The challenges, uh, you know, uh, still remain the same. It is, I think, the lack of education, lack of understanding, you know, of the issues involved. And uh, I think it's upon, uh, upon us and the DOT uh, and the fraternity, uh, like Dr. Tandon, to really educate, uh, you know, the people around us uh, that really, uh, you know, uh, there is that there is no uh, specific evidence which has been highlighted in the past on these issues. We had also seen, uh, you know, such uh, type of uh, activities happening across the world when 5G was being rolled out. But I don't think, uh, you know, these have been able to withstand because in the face of lack of evidence, there is hardly anything, uh, you know, which, uh, which we can uh, look at in future. I am also very enthusiastic. Uh, I'll just take a minute more enthusiast by Mr. Agarwal's uh, uh, you know, positive outlook on, on this entire issue. Now that we are going to roll out, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of small cells in future, we do require a very positive and enabling regime to be able to, uh, you know, uh, ensure that our rollouts are robust and a positive thinking from the government, uh, particularly on this issue is really going to go a long way in ensuring not only that we have a robust, uh, uh, you know, rollout, but also the quality of service uh, is, uh, you know, at the highest uh, benchmarks uh, which we can serve to the customer. Thank you. Uh, Rahul, thank you very much. I think you bring out some very interesting points and particularly the densification of networks and, uh, you know, uh, the challenges and need for uh, more advocacy uh, to uh, uh, bring uh, people up to speed on what the science behind this is. Because essentially, like uh, has been said, you know, it has to be science-based and evidence-based uh, policy making so that uh, we are able to justify it because if we do a random move away from an uh, internationally accepted standard, then uh, the standard gets undermined. Uh, with that, uh, I'll come to uh, uh, Ravi. So uh, Ravi, we, I recollect you know, meeting up in DOT uh, along with Sham when we interacted with the previous member T, uh, mm -hmm. highlighting the challenges uh, that uh, you know, uh, deploying a 5G network uh, would have. So please share, Ravi, uh, you know, uh, while deploying a 5G network, and for you particularly, it's a standalone network, and you have the lower, you know, spectrum band. And one of the, the challenges there is that one has to report the worst case uh, instead of the average case. And you, we also have this uh, problem of, you know, in the test procedure that 50% so a measurement which takes you to street uh, feet on street. But what do you think are the challenges? Uh, 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 that are then deploying 5G networks and what policy support uh, uh, do you recommend? Thanks, Vikram. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Sanjeev uh, for all enabling support which has been provided for rolling us rolling out five, fastest 5G network across the world. So we have now, I think, installed over 160,000 uh, base stations of 5G in 700 megahertz band as well as 23 3.3 uh, gigahertz band so as you rightly said vikram both on the lower side of the band as well as on the higher side of the band on the networks are being rolled out but i am i am very happy uh, 
the way Dr. Tandon explained uh, about non-ionizing and ionizing and the risk which are not really associated uh, with and there is no evidence around it and Jack also clarified. In fact, uh, what has changed in last 10 years? Uh, if you go back 10 years ago, uh, the there was a lot of, I think, fear around electromagnetic wave, which is now, I think, diminishing with over the period of time. So uh, uh, in in last 10 years, if you see the cases uh, of opposition have reduced because people have now started understanding that there is no linkage, there are no evidences. These were all uh, misconceptions. And as uh, the... Uh, as the industry is clarifying, as the experts like Dr. Tandon are clarifying, experts like Dr. Rolly are clarifying, now the public is also understanding. And public has started believing that uh, there are no risk attached to it. So I think that's that's the positive, positive aspect. And second is the adoption of digital. The people have adopted digital. Now they understand the value of uh, the mobile phone uh, because this is really helping them in their day-to-day -day life, whether it is digital payments or whether it's, it's e-commerce or getting e-governance services, etc. So they have now realized that there is a value of the mobile phone, which is much more than the perceived or misconception about the risk, uh, which was there at one point of time. So now at this point of time, I think uh, India also need to or take positive measures the way uh, many of the countries across the world have taken and uh, the the deterrence factor of one tenth which was imposed during 2012-13 or one tenth of ICNIP guideline. I think this is the high time when now this need to be changed and we need to align it with the ICNIP. Uh, especially when we see that the, the countries like America Lithuania, Poland, New Zealand, Australia, Slovakia, or most of the countries have now either above ICNIP standards or at least up, uh, at the ICNIP standards. So this is, I think, one uh, one of the most important uh, point which we also need to now uh, adopt. And we, we need to do it as fast as possible. Uh, as our earlier speaker has already talked about densification of the network and the requirement. One thing also which we need to understand is that earlier network, uh, 10 years ago, used to work on 5 megahertz, 10 megahertz kind of a spectrum. And now the networks are working at 100 megahertz and 1 gigahertz or 2 gigahertz kind of a spectrum. So the, the, the norms which were set for 2G cannot work with 4, 5G. The norms, testing norms which were set with 2G cannot work with 5G. So we need to change that. So earlier networks were uh, the kind of networks which are doing continuous transmission, whereas now the networks are not doing continuous transmission. It's a discontinuous transmission wherein uh, the, the transmission is not 100% of the time. Second is the earlier networks were doing particular spectrum only, say, in downlink for continuous 100% of the time, whereas in case of TDD, it, a, a substantial part of the time it is not downlink, it is uplink also. So those are the kind of things which I think need to go into the way we have set our standards, the way we measure those standards, uh, both in terms of testing at any site or for self uh, uh, self declaration, which is to be done. Though uh, I am thankful to the DOT that they have provided us the time to do self declaration, but whenever the self declarations are to be done, unless these corrections are done, uh, the 5G rollout with this, the kind of capacities which we are talking about and the densification of the network which we are talking about will not happen and uh, it would become a big bottleneck in rolling out 5G and while we have started discussing about 6G as well and for 6G also. Uh, second is when, when you do densification or when we talk about say power, by reducing power, are we reducing the exposure? The answer would be no, because uh, uh, to provide the coverage, anyway, you are reaching to closer to the user. Instead of, say, putting one base station, you are putting two base stations. 
so the exposure level remains the same it is only that you are going and measuring closer to the tower and there you are uh, by reducing uh, you are reducing the power so if you reduce the power close very very close to the tower just sitting in front of the tower or below the tower you are actually reducing the uh, the power which is to be received by the handset uh, and then you end up actually putting multiple sites so jack has shown that instead of say putting one site if you are putting 10 sites the overall though i i am not a believer that this any kind of there is an exposure which is a harmful exposure mm -hmm. but even if you for a minute assume that it's a harmful exposure then you are by having the lower limit you are actually increasing the exposure so that that i think we need to consider from that perspective if we say that by reducing the power you are actually re reducing the coverage we will not provide the coverage to the people that is not the case case so we are unnecessarily building extra network we are unnecessarily uh, creating the complications for ourselves in terms of calculation compliance submitting the compliance testing etc while we 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 are providing the coverage which is required by the handset and handsets uh, are assumed to be uh, uh, working at the safer limit, limit because those those are very very closely working with the body uh, or or ear or brain so the signal which is received by handset is also similar to what is received by handset or what is transmitted by handset so keeping that in mind the networks are not uh, uh, transmitting extra power so this i think this aspect need to be considered by uh, the policy makers uh, to ensure that the the artificial restrictions which have been put uh, under or because of certain misconception need to be removed and this is high time if we have to create a network uh, which goes in every nook and corner of the country if you want to create a world class 5g service if you want to provide the services to the use case like remote robotics or remote surgery or agriculture use cases etc we have to remove all these kind of artificial barriers thank you uh, ravi thank you very much as always you know you you combine the technical part with the policy part uh, so well so thanks and uh, 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 thanks for bringing out the power aspect and with that jack i'll come to you you know for the work at the itut study group 5 and uh, um, uh, like um, uh, could you share with the, the participants that instead of the approach so far for previous technologies was submitting compliance on a worst case scenario versus the average power which is the actual field reality right so uh, if you could dwell on that a little and uh, to explain to the uh, participants uh, how that would facilitate uh, both, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, addressing the requirements of public exposure plus building up the network. Jack. Certainly, certainly Vikram. So, uh, as you say, we've been doing for a long time these theoretical assessments of exposure, assuming maximum gain, maximum power from the transmitters, and that rarely, if ever, happens in practice. So, for a 4G site, the typical maximum is only about 25% of the, the, the rated maximum for the site. When we move to 5G, and particularly where we've got the use of active antennas, where the beam can move around as well, the, doing assessments based on a, a theoretical maximum gain, assuming the beam isn't moving, that the transmitters are operating at maximum power continuously, is just grossly overestimates the real exposures. And so we've seen this move in the ITU and in the IEC to document how you can assess compliance and declare it based on the actual maximum from the transmitters. And that can be done by recording or establishing the traffic for the site. You can set it up in software so the max that can't be exceeded. And you can do the calculations or you can do the measurements to assess compliance. Concretely, what this means is you get more accurate estimate of the actual EMF level at a location. And if you, we could talk about it in the sort of concrete terms for, for a 5G site, if you use the real maximum from the site or the actual maximum from the site, that's usually about 6 dB lower than the, the theoretical maximum. That corresponds to about a 50% reduction in the compliance zone. So rather than having to exclude 10 meters around the site, you'd exclude five meters around the site. And that's a huge difference in terms of being able to co-locate on a rooftop, 
in terms of being able to approach the antennas without having to restrict access onto a rooftop. And it means that we're actually demonstrating the real levels from the networks. And as Ravi said, the trend towards identification is important, not because it changes the EMF level from the network, but it gives greater quality of service, greater capacity for the user. And if we think about it purely from an EMF point of view, about 90% of exposure is from device use, not from the networks. And so anything that improves the quality of the network ultimately reduces the, the, net, the EMF exposure from the devices. But going back to the, your comment, Vikram, we're already seeing countries such as the UK, France, Australia, uh, South America, uh, Brazil is currently consulting on moving to implement compliance assessments based on the actual power from the sites and not the theoretical in order to mean that we are more accurately accessing the real EMF levels. Uh, Jack, thank you very much for clarifying that part because we have a large number. I noticed 107 attendees, many of them from the state, uh, from TEC or DOT and the state, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, levels. So uh, it, it is coming out quite uh, unequivocal that we need to build up the networks in, in a substantial way in compliance with the uh, uh, the globally harmonized and WHO recommended ICNIRT norms uh, rather than a more stringent one, because we would be doing ourselves a disservice if we, if we uh, you know, and all the panelists are highlighting that part. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and also that technology has substantially changed. You know, we have the type of MIMO, uh, 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 so, and its relationship to the power uh, policy uh, versus the uh, reporting uh, certification, reporting and measurement. So thank you very much. And I'm sure all our members here from CUI would also contribute to the ITT, ITUT's uh, study group five work with a meeting coming up uh, in uh, Annapolis, I think, uh, uh, shortly. With that, uh, you know, I would uh, really like to come back to you, Dr. Tandon, once again. Uh, you know, uh, you put so clearly, could you explain in a simplified way the facts of, uh, about EMF emissions and the perceived impact on health and, you know, difference between speculation and real life situations? So, uh, you know, if you could help us with that. Dr. Tandon. We uh, <clears throat> broadly categorized, if you look at these things, the people who are complaining about sleep disorder, attention, cognitive disorders, and hearing disorders, what they complain to doctors is that once a tower has been erected near their house, they are, ha they are having problems. My question to these people, these people are, is that, can you perceive radiation? The answer to this question is no. Our body has only sensors which can perceive radiation, which is in the form of light or heat. We are not able to perceive whether a mobile tower is switched on or off because there are no sensors in the body. So if you cannot perceive something, how can you be disturbed because of that? And that is why there are so many studies which are randomized trials, which show that sleep, at least attention and cognition and hearing, these are not the, uh, the cause for problems in these areas is not the EMM. It can be overexposure to a mobile device if you are addicted to it, if you are addicted to Instagram, Facebook, and you're continuously uh, tweeting. I mean, these are the kind of situations mm -hmm. where you will land up with these kind of problems, but they are not per se related directly to the EMF. And now coming to another thing that has been reported in literature is the increased blood flow to brain. That is, if you are exposed to EMF, it will lead to increased blood flow to brain. It has been reported. But is it really because of EMF or is it the effect of the uh, thermal effect that these mobile phones have? The answer again is it, is it is more often than not because of the thermal effect that the mobile has. Because if you remember uh, talking to a person for more than 30 minutes, the mobile gets heated up and it's very near to your ear. And that can lead to increased perfusion to the brain. But brain, again, is a very self-regulated organ and it's able to regulate that. So again, it's not a very uh, harmful effect, I should rather say, but one should try using Bluetooth devices 
if they are in a business where they have to talk continuously on mobile phones, say, for example, if you are a stockbroker and you are continuously on phone, you should utilize these Bluetooth devices. And then comes the important aspect of uh, tumors. Is the in incidence of tumors increasing in the world? Is it so? The answer again is probably no. There are so many causes to it. Is it proper to attribute it only to one cause? It's not proper according to me. If you look at the literature which Jack was showing you, or if you look at the studies which have been done, say for example, the Cosmos study, the Denmark study, and all these studies which have been done in the Norwegian region, they are studies which are based on population. They have been done for a very, very long period of time, more than 15 years, 20 years, and yet, they haven't found any evidence. So what do you conclude from that? You say that there might be a risk over a very, very long period of time, but still as where we are standing today, we cannot conclusively prove that. And are the, there enough number of studies? The answer is there is no carcinogen in the world which has been as researched as EMFS at present. That is the basic truth. If you look at carcinogen 2B, where WHO has placed this, you will realize the talcum powder, coffee, aloe vera, even these have been placed into the carcinogen 2B type. And the reason why these things are put is there might be one study, two study, which says that, okay, it is a carcinogen. And then there are multiple studies which show the negative impact of it. And I think uh, my suggestion to Sanjeev Agarwalji you guys from COI is that we should look at having a committee which should dedicatedly keep on reviewing the research that is being published. And that's something which Department of Telecom should constitute. And that is what was done in 2011, which you were quoting, quoting because at that point of time, Allahabad High Court had constituted that committee, which was supposed to look at all the research work that has been done. There were people from IIT Mumbai who had submitted the, about the harmful effects and the same was refuted by multiple people who were from the, that field and ultimately the government of India and at the same time High Court also. No, we, that uh, now it's back. Yeah, so government of India and High Court also accepted that report. So I think it's high time with the induction of 5G technology the spectrum of the radiation has changed. The number of studies which are dedicated only towards a higher spectrum, more than greater than six gigahertz or lesser in number. So we can have a committee which dedicatedly looks at the new publications which are coming in. And at the same time, uh, I would request people from the industry to partner with AIMS. You partner with AIMS. AIMS, Jack, you, you might not be aware, is like a city in itself where 25,000, 30,000 patients and their caregivers, they walk in every day. It's, it's like a city in itself. So why not partner with a place like AIMS, create a model hospital and measure all the, uh, I mean, levels that you want to do. Look at the feedback. Look at the feedback before and after you have converted AIMS into a model telecom infrastructure hospital. What is happening? I will tell you the number of lives that can be saved by digital intervention, which is related to telecom, is immense. What are we talking about? In which world we are living? You see, when a patient comes to our emergency department, a junior resident sees the patient and he has to inform a senior person. There is no network there at times. And then he has to go out of the emergency and then he has to ping a doctor and then somebody gets to see the scan and he's able to advise the amount of time that we will be able to save in treating a person, giving quick care, will help so many people. We can provide telemedicine and remote consultation. Somebody was talking about remote surgery, robotic surgery. You, we can utilize IoT devices and connect them and get the algorithm made which can help you provide predictions when person is going to develop problem. We can save enough number of people which can outset, I can say, 
the harmful effects which might be there. But at the same time, I would say with a word of caution that we must continuously and judiciously continue to look at the scientific evidence which is evaluated. Which is, uh, which is Dr. Tandon, thank you very much. I think some very valid suggestions. And, you know, I can see that you being chair of the 5G committee at Ames uh, reaching out. So uh, thank you for those comments. Yes, I'm sure all our members uh, will take a note of that. And uh, the, in the past, the committee, Alabad High Court uh, uh, Committee, with all the experts, yes, they did a pretty diligent job. So thank you for that and for your suggestions. I would encourage the participants at this stage, uh, should you have uh, uh, any questions, please post the questions on the Q&A box uh, uh, so that we can uh, uh, attend, uh, attend to any queries that you have. Uh, but uh, it, it has been really nice for all of you to have participated. And just as a last uh, couple of things, we've heard uh, from uh, all, our, uh, all the experts here on the panel, but just coming back to you, Balaji, uh, uh, and to you, Rahul, if uh, you could suggest, are there any things as part of the EMF, you know, there are these TRAI recommendations on uh, uh, reducing the compliance burden. So while uh, DOT has attended to a lot, but yes, if you have any other suggestions, one on reduction of the compliance burden, the other is on uh, how any suggestions on doing more advocacy uh, um, uh, from our side. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just take 30 seconds. Um, a lot has been already spoken about. The government and the regulator have been very pragmatic and uh, thoughtful as well in making everything come in public domain. So with this Tarang Sanchar, and everything else around it to make sure it's more transparent and the industry has responded by making sure all of that is available. People can transparently seek out whatever information they need if they have any misgivings of any nature. And I think that's the best proof. We are a very uh, transparent industry and very visible. And we'd like to just continue doing more of that and we are in turn request support uh, for things to be not driven by perception, but by, uh, by all the scientific research and as uh, Dr. Tandon said, the most researched topic is this in, in the world as far as uh, carcinogenic uh, studies are concerned. And if that is pointing in the direction that we are in, then clearly there's a need to be more uh, pragmatic to uh, benefit hugely from the uh, revolution of 4G, 5G and beyond. Thank you so much, uh, Balaji. Uh, any, anything from you, Rahul? Yeah, I, I just want to add uh, on the TRA recommendation part, uh, you know, which you mentioned, it's a very important recommendation. And I'm sure the DOT is going to consider it because uh, today, uh, you know, the entire procedure we have around uh, seven and a half lakh BTS. If you take up the industry, we'll have around 22 lakh BTSs. And with 36 fields, uh, you know, into every, uh, you know, uh, self-certification, you are looking at millions uh, of field entries. One of them can go wrong, right? So, so there needs to be a simplification of the certification process for sure. And also create a procedure where if you do enter by mistake, you should, should have an opportunity to correct it. Otherwise, you are uh, straight onto the penalty regime. So it's an administrative issue, but I'm sure uh, the DUT will consider it because really with the um, humongous amount of data you are putting, uh, there is no case uh, you know, for an error to creep in and then you know, be penalized for that. That's all I want to add. Uh, uh, thanks, Raul. Actually, you know, uh, uh, maybe if Jack can help us. Uh, uh, in some of the countries I've noticed, at least uh, the ACMA in Australia, if there is a non-compliance, they actually uh, give you some time to correct it. And particularly, if, uh, we did manage to get a submission uh, done, but yes, we can take up again. I see two questions, and these are from the policymakers. So the DDG CS, as uh, uh, Mr. Bishnoi has posted, can anyone on the panel say how a country like Italy and some other countries are managing services, even stricter norms than India? Uh, and his colleague Manish Tripathi says, uh, Russia, China, Italy, some area of Paris and Brussels, which have rolled out 5G at a fraction of ICNET recommended EMF norms. So can GSMA or somebody indicate, uh, you know, what has been their experience and is the, are there networks actually serving uh, uh, the uh, customers well enough or not? Uh, Jack, would you like to take a stab at that? Sure, I can, I can have a start, uh, Bikram. So, Italy has done a number of things to allow 5G. It's already in the context of 4G allowed assessments to be made on the actual 
power from the base station, so that reduces the size of the compliance zone significantly. So far, there's relatively little traffic on the 5G networks in Italy, so the limits haven't been so much of a problem. That said, the Environment Agency in, in, in Italy has recognized that they are effectively running out of capacity on those restrictive limits for the 4G networks, never mind for deployment of 5G. So it's going to become a crunch point some point in the near future. Uh, in Italy, there have been two votes in Parliament, attempts to increase the limit. They require, because it's in law, they require a, a parliamentary vote. Politics so far have not allowed that change to be made, but it's been recommended in the recovery plan in Italy that harmonization with the, the international limits is essential for effective 5G rollout. In the context of Brussels, there is no 5G in Brussels because the limits are too restrictive. Last year, Brussels announced a plan to increase the limits, not all the way to ICNAR, but at least enough to allow initial 5G deployments. That's not complete yet. So there is no 5G in Brussels. There is in other parts of Belgium, but not in Brussels itself. Um, the equivalent of DOT in Belgium, the BIPT has recognized that the restrictive limits are causing saturation of the 4G network in Brussels at the moment. So this is driving a need to review the limits there. Um, this is a political situation in Brussels. They're not going to step all the way to the international limits, unfortunately, it appears this time around. But it's something they're going to have to face in the future. They've done this previously. They went from three volts per meter to six volts per meter. They'll have to go to 14 and a half volts per meter uh, at 900 megahertz before they can start going with 5G. But that's only a temporary solution that they'll have to face in the future. In terms of other countries, two countries that wanted to have successful 5G, Lithuania, Poland, they went from in Lithuania's case, similar to India, 10 times under ICNR, in Poland's case, 100 times under ICNR, to the ICNR limits to make sure that 5G would be successful. Uh, and that's been a signal in other markets as well. So you can deploy, but as uh, Open Signal has shown, uh, the quality in countries which have restrictive limits is less than the quality of countries that have the international EMF limits. Uh, thank you very much, Jack. So, uh, um, Bishnoiji and uh, Manish, I think um, uh, that's an indicator as to, uh, you know, if you are away from ICNIRP, you're actually your network is going to be, uh, you know, not as effective. And uh, it, it's not based on uh, science or physics. Uh, there are other considerations. So, um, you know, like the panels have said, uh, uh, approach should be a science and evidence based to policy making. Uh, with that, uh, would any panelists have any other comment to make? If uh, uh, you have, uh, just uh, please uh, unmute and you're welcome to make any uh, last uh, uh, passing remarks. Anyone? If not, uh, so uh, thank you very much to our panelists. Uh, so I'll request all the participants to, you know, uh, maybe uh, uh, join me in applauding our panelists. So thank you very much uh, uh, for all, all the panelists and the expert advice. Uh, I noticed one question coming up, Dr. Tandon's telling about perceiving EMF is not correct as X-ray. Let me just see, it's coming in the chat box. Yeah, so um, I would just like to respond to this question. The person has asked that we cannot perceive EMF, we cannot also perceive X-ray. The person must realize that EMF is in a frequency zone which is non-ionizing. While X-ray has the potential of uh, ionizing things also, right? So it's a different spectrum altogether. The different energy is there. And uh, unfortunately for us, who are neurosurgeons, we are exposed to all these radiations more than anybody else. So we work it with the thing which is called as gamma knife. It has cobalt though we are not exposed to it, but we do work with it. It has a radiation hazard. And X-ray is something which with, we are regularly exposed to. And we have to wear barriers as well as the gadgets which show the exposure level. X-ray cannot, uh, cannot be equated with EMF at all. I should rather tell him. We have intraoperative MRI also. That machine is a 1.5 Tesla machine. And the magnetic strength is such that if you go near to that machine, it can pull your pen, which is in your pocket, like a bullet. 
So that radiation also is not equivalent to the X-ray radiation. So it's not proper to equate these two things. It's like comparing apples and oranges. Dr. Tandon, thank you once again. I think uh, uh, this uh, uh, would adequately address this query. Uh, with that, uh, once again, we come to the end of this panel discussion. Uh, it's time now also, and one would hand it back to uh, Shame uh, for his uh, uh, vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so on behalf of CUI and GSMA, I would like to thank our chief guest, Sri Sanjeev Agarwalji, member TDOT, for taking time out uh, from his busy schedule and gracing the occasion. We thank him for providing the special address and highlighting about the significant safety measures taken by the government with respect to EMF and adoption of globally accepted guidelines and regarding the MNS being created by the DOT with respect to health effects uh, due to uh, EMF. Uh, I thank our DG, sir, uh, Lieutenant General Kocher, for his welcome remarks and the encouragement and support provided for conducting this event. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Julian Gorman, head APAC GSMA, for his introductory remarks through video and support in collaboration between GSM and CUI. I also take this opportunity to thank our uh, panelists, Dr. Vivek Tandon, Mr. P. Balaji, Mr. Rahul Wirtz, Mr. Ravi Gandhi, and our moderator, Mr. Vikram Tivatia for sharing their thoughts and views on 5G future outlook and safety aspects. Uh, we thank Dr. Jack Rowley for his presentation, uh, taking us through the various studies and research uh, that has been undertaken or reviewed by researchers uh, of the highest integrity across the world and indicating that there is no uh, conclusive evidence to establish a correlation between radio signals uh, from base station deployed on the telecom uh, tower. Thank you, Dr. Rowley. Uh, I thank uh, uh, GSM and CUI team involved in the conduct of event and working behind the scenes for successful conduct of the event. And last but not least, thanks to all the delegates who have joined us virtually to be part of this event discussion today. We believe that the event was useful and the key takeaways from the discussion will help the industry for the commitment towards the meeting the reference level for limiting EMF exposure and creating awareness among the citizens regarding the myths of the health hazards due to the EMF exposure. Further, also, we believe that discussion uh, will be helpful in defining the EMF norms in India and adopting the latest SIGNAP 2020 norms as a global best practice. We are hopeful that the government will take a favorable decision in this regard. With that, we conclude this event. Thank you and have a great year ahead. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you everyone.